Let's turn our Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 4 this morning. We are closing out another book of the Bible. We're blessed to do that. I would encourage you to read ahead in Hebrews, the next book we're going into, and uh, just start reading it, taking notes, see what God is speaking to you about as we will go verse by verse through the book of Hebrews, um, perhaps next time we meet. Also, as you're turning there, we want to remind you of the Appalachian Mission trip. They did have their cold but uh, blessed... Um, uh, what, what would you call it, a yard sale. And uh, they raised over $500, $568.69 to be exact. But uh, No, not 69 cents. But if you're interested in still giving toward this short mission trip, it's going from April 7th to April 10th. You can, uh, if you want to give, provide a check, or uh, and you can put it in the black box, just write in the memo, uh, Appalachian Mission or something like that so we'll know exactly where the funds will go to. So that would be a blessing. Another thing, uh, as far as somebody's asking about supporting, of course, the, the, the war there in Ukraine, and uh, I'll, I'll tell you, and I'm sure we'll tell you on family meeting, that we have sent funds uh, out there, a uh, uh, pretty substantial amount, praise God, as God has uh, blessed us with, and we've turned it over to the, the people there th- through Calvary Chapel, and so they have ministries out there, so just know that we're supporting them in prayer and in funding, you know, they can use it, uh, you know, they need so much, so I, just to let you guys know uh, where your tithes and offerings are headed to, and you're all part of that, amen? God is so good to us, we'll, we'll, sh- we'll share more about that on Wednesday. So let's pray, and then we'll study through the word. So Father, we do pray for the people of Ukraine, Lord. Uh, The devastation there, those who are mourning, crying, Lord, hurting. Those who are uh, separated from uh, husbands and and sons and daughters. Those who are mourning, Lord God, for, for the families who have perished, Lord, with no reason and no purpose. And so God, we just pray and uh, we ask that you would hold them and protect them. We pray for the teams that are going out there or the, or the churches that are already established there in Poland and Romania and those outer countries, Lord, on the border. And God, we just pray, Lord, that you would protect all the people and that you would stop this devastation, Lord. We put it in your hands. We're grateful, Lord, to open your word and to just study through it. And we ask that you would speak to us personally and congregationally, Lord. And this we ask because we can, in Jesus' name, everyone said, amen. Amen. Praise God. You know, I don't know if you read ahead, and this is not the most exciting part of this letter, most exciting portion, but if you begin to read it and read it over again, you get a sense that, that Paul is speaking of friends and foes. Uh, Paul is at his last here. I mean, these words written were, were it. The, the, the ink, you know, has stopped. There will be nothing else written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So what we are holding in our hands or on your lap or in your device are the last written words by Paul. I, I want you to know that because what he wants to write about, what he wants to close with is really speaking, as I said, of mainly friendships. And, and, of course, the warning toward uh, departing uh, the ministry and also the warning toward those who are against the ministry. And I find it interesting that, that Paul has honorable mention of names that he, that he loves so much. You know, Proverbs 18.24 tells us this, A man that hath friends must show himself friendly. And there is a friend that sticketh closer Then a brother, you guys know that proverb. We usually interpret that friend that sticks closer than a brother as Jesus. You say, well, why would a scholar do that? Why would a Bible student or Bible teacher do that? Because John 15, 15 tells us this. This is Jesus speaking. At least it's in red letters. It says, no longer do I call you servants. For a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you what? Friends, 
For all things that I heard from my Father, I have made known to you. And I love that with our relationship with Jesus. All that he has been given of the Father he has made known not only to the twelve, but also to us. He has made that known through his word. He keeps nothing back. There's nothing that Jesus doesn't know that he hasn't shared with us, in a sense, when he came to earth. He keeps nothing back. That's a good friend. But even within the Bible and the things that he has shared with us, there are great things, but there are also warnings, aren't there? There are also, he, he cares so much about us that the conviction of the Holy Spirit, when we read certain things, wow, it just does a job on us, doesn't it? And it will be a completed job if we uh, respond to it, if, if we're hearers and doers of God's word. Guys, close friends, closest friend that we should have on earth, when you think about it, and speaking of friends, is if you're married, is your who? Spouse, I gave it away when I said married, right? Your wife, your husband should be your best friend. And we should be working toward getting closer and closer together. Listen, we're going to live in eternity with each other in that capacity in heaven. You better start liking each other now. Okay? You better invest in one another and love one another. You promised that at the altar. You promised that before God and the priest or the pastor or the minister. Keep that promise. Grow together. Become best of friends. On earth, our best friend, if we're married, should be our spouse. And if we're not married, it should be somebody that you're confident with, someone that you can share with, a close friend that you can just be able to bear everything to and trust them with it, you know, and, and trust them. Uh, and, and stay pure and, and stay holy. But in trusting this person, this friend, you know, there's, there's many friends. We have many friends, but there's always that one, isn't it? That one that sticks close. There's always that one that you can confide in, that one that you can trust. Of course, Jesus is our closest friend, and I'm so glad for that. Because when that friend, or if that friend leaves, you always have Jesus Christ. I want you to see that in this these last w words that Paul writes. Paul will say, uh, 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 everyone left me, but I'm not alone. Because that friend that sticketh closer than a brother, Jesus was always with him. And I want you to see that this morning. I want you to walk out of here from this teaching this morning, um, as I put here, uh, knowing that there are friends and foes, but more importantly, you being friendly. You being that one that reaches out. Perhaps you don't have a friend like that. Well, we'll pray for one. Pray for someone that will come close to you. Or perhaps your marriage isn't, isn't the way it should be. You're, you're not friends. Uh, you're acquaintances. Or in some cases, you're, you're married, living, single. That's not good. That's not what marriage is about. We need to grow and we need to work at it. So Paul here, he speaks of friends. He speaks of foes. He'll speak. He'll give warnings. Uh, you know, what do you say, as I said last week, what do you say in your last words, man? What do you tell? What do you write? Well, here he began with an urgent plea. Look at verse 10, Alpha, or, 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 or 9, excuse me. He says, be diligent to come to me quickly. Be diligent to come to me quickly. This is an urgent plea of Paul's. And it's very urgent. He wants Timothy to come and visit him. He wanted to see his son in faith on earth one more time before the day when they will embrace in heaven. And that's just like a father. That's just like one who loves another Hey, hey, come, Timothy, come quickly. I don't know when my time is, will end. I don't know when the executioner's sword will be placed upon my neck. But until that time, come, come see me, come visit me. I love that fact. I love that here is Paul on death row. He's a dead man writing. He's a dead man walking. But he's calling for Timothy. And he's asking some other requests. And he's summarizing everything that he can on, on, on parchment so that he, he can just, you know, give out his last will and testament to others. 
I also like Paul has a hopeful outlook here. Uh, he, he just has this hopeful outlook by asking Timothy to come visit him. Again, if you read it, he's requesting some personal things. He's got a great outlook on life, even though his life is about to be taken. Proverbs 69 tells us this. A man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his step. And we know that proverb. And here, there's nothing wrong with planning. Absolutely nothing wrong with planning. We should all have a plan. We should all have, you know, but we're always going to be focused on heaven. You know, that's our destination. That's, that's where we're going. But until that time, nothing wrong with planning. Planning a family, planning for your family, for your kids, or for yourselves, you know, when you're empty nesters. But um, nothing wrong with that. Because the Lord could come today. He could come at 1146. That would be a great time to come. Well, I'm on the pulpit. I would love that. But, but nothing wrong with planning. And here, Paul, he's got that great outlook. He's got that faith. He's got that hope. He, he, he understands that until they take my breath, I will continue in having a great outlook on life, knowing where I'm going. In verse 10, he continues on. He says, notice this. He says, for Demas has forsaken me. Having loved this present world, it has departed for Thessalonica. We'll stop right there. This is indeed a sad report, isn't it? You know, as Bible students, and you guys are taught well here, and you are Bible uh, people. I remember uh, one of the uh, reform uh, uh, names. I won't mention his name, but he ran into a, a brother who attends this church, and and the, and he asked. This guy, he goes, uh, so what church do you go to? And the guy says, well, I go to Calvary Chapel. He goes, oh, you're Bible people. He knew that. You're Bible people. And, he, and he, uh, he, he says, my sister goes to a Calvary Chapel. And this guy's a great expositor of the word and everything. No, it's not MacArthur, somebody else. But uh, we're Bible students. And as Bible students, we know that name Demas, or you've heard it at least before. We met him. As Paul gave him honorable mention in a few other letters. In Colossians 4.14, we know him there where it says, Luke, the beloved physician. Keep that in your mind, by the way. And Demas greets you. Luke and Demas greet you. And then in Philemon, that wonderful book I call Filet Mignon. It's such a, a, a great cut, isn't it? You read that letter? We studied it earlier. And it was there where... It says, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus greets you, as do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke. And Paul calls them my fellow laborers. I mean, Demas was on the team. We could call it the dream team if you want. Imagine serving alongside of Paul, Paul being your mentor, hanging out, being able to hang out with one who was called by Jesus Christ himself as an apostle a fellow laborer, a partaker of communion with the brethren, but not now. Not now. He says, Demas has forsaken me. The word forsaken means to leave, to let one down, to desert or abandon. Just, just, just to take off. No word, no two-week notice, just took off. He flew, he fled. So what happened well, I'm glad you asked that because Paul tells us what happened. He says, having loved this present world, he left the ministry for the world. Think about that. He left the ministry for the world. 1 John 2.16 says, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, listen, is not of the Father but of this world. What did he leave for? How did he just take off? What happened? Well, as I am studying this and, and praying on this, you know, I think of myself in, in the short time when I backslid, in, in the short time that I walked away. It was very, praise God that it happened in my first year as being a Christian. I thank God for that because I learned a lot of lessons. 
But I could put something like that together and I would think that demons stopped looking up. He, 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 he wasn't focused anymore. He, he, he wasn't focused on his destination. He wasn't focused on what he was called to do through the Holy Spirit. The gifts that were given to him. The gifts that he were to exercise and being part of the team, laborers with, with Paul. His heart could have grown cold toward Paul um, and those who love and waited for Christ's appearing. Notice last time, remember in, in verse 8 of this chapter, um, Paul says that finally there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And here it is, not only me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. He's forgotten that. He, his love for Christ's appearing, the, the urgency, the, the, the way you live life with the expectancy, as I said earlier, that Christ could come today. These, these men like Paul, they felt like Christ could come in their day, and they lived that way. And that's important. Perhaps he, he just grow, grew cold to that. His love for this world, listen, was not the kind of love that God has for it. Uh, in giving his son, that many would come to faith. It, it wasn't the love that we are to have for this world as we pray for it, as we share the gospel and be the salt and light in it. But we are never to be or work toward being of it. Our address changed when we accepted Christ as our Lord and Savior. And no doubt, you know, experiencing the blessings of being in ministry, the blessings of being on the team, planning churches, preaching and teaching from the scriptures. No doubt there was that. But he also perhaps was seeing the not so good experiences. Uh, seeing that Nero was turning the fire up on these Christians, as we shared with you last time, and has seen now Paul, his mentor, being in prison and thinking, is that what I want? Is that what this ministry business is going to lead to? That I'm going to get locked up? That I'm going to be in the worst prison that there ever could be in Rome? I, I don't know. But I do know it says that he left he have loved this present world. He loved this present world. Demas chose to leave instead of fight the good fight. He abandoned Paul, just like Mark had done. You know Mark, also known as John Mark. Mark, here in Acts 13, 13, we read where Paul set out on his first missionary journey they're about in the middle of it and all of a sudden it tells us that John departed from them and he returned to Jerusalem his second missionary journey that Paul went on remember in Acts 15 where Barnabas was determined to take that same Mark John called Mark but Paul says oh no he insisted that they should not take with him the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. Paul says, no, he's no good to me. He's a, he's a deserter. He's left. Well, Barnabas got upset. Of course, they're, they're family, you know. But, but Barney, or Barnabas, his name means, what, son of consolation, encouragement, uh, you know, and he is a man who has that heart, that gift of that. It's, he saw in Mark his potential. Paul said, absolutely not. Paul's hardcore, no, he's not coming. And, and we know it became a dispute among themselves, a very sharp disagreement, and they went off in their own way. T uh, Paul takes Titus and, uh, and, and that team, and uh, uh, Barney, Barney takes uh, Mark, and they go off. But Paul is not saying here, back to Demas, that Demas became an apostate, that he deserted He's a deserter of the Lord, but he just quit the ministry. You know, at his lowest point, as Paul's lowest point, although he has a great outlook, an uplook in his lowest point, 
Here's Demas that decides to take off. He decides to go back to the world. And, and you know, and, and just quit. And it left Paul in a bad way. Let me ask, are there any Demases here today? Is there anyone that's come in today that perhaps you said, you know what, I'm done, man. Maybe you've been hurt. Hey, you know what? The church hurts people, unfortunately. We hurt people. Somebody said, the church is the, is the largest, biggest dysfunctional family there is. We're a family. Perhaps the ministry has hurt you. Perhaps things have happened and, and, and you're not focusing on Christ of whom you've been called to the ministry, to, to serve, to be active. And let me just tell you, don't leave, man. I, I, like I said last week, right? Abide. Don't take off. We need you. Hang in there. No, and, and if you do leave, if this is your last Sunday, come back and let us know if there's anything out there in the world worth living. Come, come back and let, please let us know. Is there anything out in the world that's better than this? Better than being a monk? Sure. We are people. We're in the people business. And some of us are going through our sanctification process and others of us are a little slower than but We mean no harm. But you come back and let us know if that world out there is any better. Because we would surely like to know that. Well, I can tell you it's not. So be careful when you go out there. Be careful if you are planning on leaving. We would want you to stay. And stay close to your friend. Stay close to the closest friend that you'll ever have, and that's Jesus Christ. You need to stay. He moves on, if you would, and he continues to speak about faithful brethren. He says here that um, Cretans, uh, if I'm saying that right, went for Galatia. Uh, Galatia, you know, Paul established a church there as well. Titus for Dalmatia. You know what people are called in that region of Dalmatia? Dalmatians, yeah. And the population is only 101. <laughs> Just kind of making it a little bit more ease here, yeah. No, it was, it was a little province in Illyricum. Uh, I don't even know how to say that. Moving on. So, you know, just talking about faithful brethren. And then he says, notice, verse 11, only Luke is with me. I love that guy, Luke. And notice he says, get Mark. And once again, that's that's the Mark that Paul wanted nothing to do with. He says, get Mark and bring him with you. Notice, for he is useful to me. Wow, for ministry. That's really emotional to me. That really touches me. I love this. He says, he continues on here, and he says, and Tychicus, if I'm saying that right, my son said, Dad is tight cheeks. I said, no, son, get, a, get behind me. <laughs> it's Tychicus. He says, I have sent to Ephesus another, another place where Paul had... Uh, Established church. This is in Ephesus is where Timothy's pastoring. So notice this. Don't miss this. I missed it in the first service. As he's calling for Timothy to come, he's sending Tychicus to take his place, at least temporarily, as Timothy begins his journey. So he's sending. Uh, listen, in ministry, we are either being called to, sent to, planted at or in a bad way like Demas, departing from. The first three is in faithful obedience here. Cretans, Titus, and Mark were called. Tychicus was being sent, and Luke is planted at Rome with Paul. It's Luke. You know him, right? He wrote the Gospel of Luke. He wrote the book of Acts. This is a guy, a Gentile, that was called by God to write these two wonderful uh, books under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. You know, if, if, I've even seen where you can buy the book of uh, Luke and the book of Acts and just read that together. 
That's how powerful, of course, the Word of God is powerful, but that's how cool if somebody put the gospel and, the, and acts together so you could read it in one sitting. Luke was a saved Gentile physician who accompanied Paul on his missionary trips to Asia, to Macedonia, to Jerusalem, and to Rome. He never, you know, just left Paul. If he did hang out and if he did go, you know, it was either being sent or he was being called to come back. Um, But I love this because Luke, being a saved Gentile and a physician and a scribe, a writer, well, he's the right person to be with Paul at, at this time. Could he be the scribe that actually wrote for Paul this letter? We don't know, but we know he's a man who can write. Was he there because Paul had a lot of ailments? Well, Paul did need a physician's focus, a physician's hand. Hey, Luke is there for him. What I'm trying to say is, look at the humility of Luke. The man who either was in the middle of writing these wonderful books, but just saw himself as a servant. He could say, well, wait a minute, Paul. I'm, I'm, don't you know that I wrote my own gospel? Paul, Paul, don't you know that I'm about to write the most historical book of the Christian faith? No, he's there, man. And he's looking down at him because Paul's in like a sewer type of prison. And he's looking down and said, brother, what can I... He's getting dirty with him. He's, he's there. He's ministering to him. Paul, do you want me to take something? Want me to write out? What do you want me to do? Hey, here's some medicine. Here's some wine with that stomach ailment, per se, as Paul would tell Timothy. I just want you to see the humility of this man who could have taken a different type of approach, but he's humble, he's broken. He listen, he's there. He's there. And he's okay in being there because he's serving the Lord. Who better to attend Paul, the right person to be with Paul at the right time? But he also says, again, he mentions Mark, and he wants Mark. He says, hey, Timothy, I'm sending... I'm sending this guy to take help to take the church, you know, leadership of the church. As you're coming, pick up Mark on your way. Get Mark. Get John Mark. Get the one who once deserted me. Here, get Mark, who was once like a Demas, but now is fit for the ministry. I mean, he mentions him. He mentions them in Colossians 4.10. He says, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you with Mark, the cousin of Barney, Barnabas, about whom you received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. And then we see him again in Philemon, as we said earlier, where he's called there as a fellow laborer, a fellow laborer. And now he's saying, bring him with you. Pick him up on your way. He goes, man, he is useful. He's useful to me for ministry. Guys, I love restoration as much as repentance. I love it. I love what repentance does. Repentance restores us, brings us back, renews us, brings restoration, you know, to our heart, uh, toward, you know, uh, the work. It, It brings us back. And I love that. And this is what we see in the life of Mark. Paul wanted to make mention of him. Paul needed him. And although Timothy probably would not make it, Paul still had a great outlook. And he's still requesting. We don't know if if Timothy was there. We don't know if Mark was there. But when this letter is being read, I can see tears coming down Mark's face. And what God really had grown him to be and matured him to be. And here is Paul, who were once at odds with him in his love, saying he's useful to me for ministry. There's a personal request there. Would you look at verse 13? He says, bring the cloak. A cloak was really like a poncho. It was made out of uh, wool, fit over the head. It came all the way down past the knees. Well, they also would use it as a coat. And winter is coming. You'll mention that. 
Paul, again, being the smart man that he is, he's asking him, would you grab my, would you grab the cloak that I left in with Carpus at Troas when you come? And then he says, and the books, oh, especially the parchments. The books, Biblion is that name. Uh, they say it's a, it was a, a small book, a uh, 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 documents, sheets that you can write on or notes that perhaps Paul had taken. And then parchments, that word is membrana. It's the vellum. It's the parchment made of animal skin. Many scholars believe that was actually, it contained the scriptures, the scrolls. So I, I love this of Paul. Uh, see, guys, leaders are readers, amen? And leaders are note takers, you know, as we sit to just read the scriptures devotionally, you, you can't help but writing things down because God is speaking to us. And you can't help but taking notes if you're studying for a lesson or studying for a, a sermon. But you rate, take notes down. And then you look to others who have studied and others who have commented, you know, to see if you're in, on track or or for them to give you a nugget or an insight. Uh, he's a reader and he's a note taker. And here Paul continues to study. And he continues to write to the end. We can learn much in that. He gives a warning as, as he should. He gives a warning against a man by the name of Alexander. Notice in verse 14. Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm, he says. May the Lord repay him according to his works. You also must be aware of him, for he has greatly resisted our words. Now, a coppersmith is one who works with metal. We could guess that like the silversmiths that we in, were introduced to in the book of Acts, who brought or tried to bring harm to Paul, who brought harm to Paul, this could be the same kind of, of, uh, of uh, mention that Paul's He's writing here of another one, another metal worker who would make idols. And really, Paul was putting the idol uh, guys out of work. I mean, you know, because people were getting saved. And they realized that these were just idols and they would burn them. And he makes mention here and he warns Paul that this guy, this certain person, he's against the gospel. He's against the mission, the commission. He's against our vision and why we're called and what we're doing. See, guys, Satan has his workers too. Satan has his team. And his team is devoted to evil works. And I think this is great that, that Paul is warning Timothy about this guy. You notice there was no why does the coppersmith live and I must die attitude here. Now, he knows he's out there for what, what, whatever, you know, why he's allowed to live and why he's allowed to keep going on and bringing harm to the church, but he's warning against him. He's telling Timothy, know your enemy. Know the enemy of whom Satan uses for our destruction. He's warning others that we need to be careful of those who try to bewitch others either from the faith or coming to the faith. He says, be careful, be careful, watch out. You see, a shepherd is trained to protect the sheep, and the sheep must inform other sheep of the wolf that is among them. Timothy must be on guard for this worker and other workers of iniquity. Of iniquity. But notice Paul's attitude toward this. He says, there, may the Lord repay him according to his works. We must do the warning, absolutely. We're not worth our salt if we're not warning people. And we must, uh, you know, do any practical measures needed to protect other sheep. If we find a wolf here, well, quite gently walk him out to the door and kick him out. And then we leave the rest to the Lord. But we warn people. We warn them. And we leave the judgment to God. And what Paul is doing here is he's practicing what he preached. Where it's written in Romans 12, 19, Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Oh, he's warning them. And he says in other epistles, in other 
Mark those people. Mark them. Watch them. Watch out for them. As I said before, if you see somebody walking out with a sheep in its mouth, it's, that's a pretty good sign that we've got a wolf among us. Then he goes on a testimony of faith. Look at verse 16 and 18. He says, at my first defense, no one stood with me. You ever been alone? You ever felt that way? You ever had to stand, you felt all by yourself? Where is everyone? Why is nobody here? Well, he says this, at my first defense, no one stood with me. He says, but all forsook me. May it not be charged against him. I love that. He's like his Lord. He's like his Savior who was hurt himself, who was taken amongst his own of whom he came to save and was put on a cross. And what would Jesus say to his father? Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. How many of us could say that in the midst of a trial, in the midst of backstabbing and, and being talked about and, or going through something and being accused? Can we say that? It's hard. It's difficult, isn't it? He cried out like the one of whom he approved to kill. He cried out just like um, Stephen. And Stephen's last words, he said, Lord, do not charge them with this sin as they stoned him to death. This is what Paul is speaking of here. Although they all left me, I don't have any, you know, I have nothing against them. May the Lord forgive them. May their charge may not be against them. But this is what I really love, God. If nothing, guys, if nothing else, look at verse 17. But the Lord, what? Stood with me and strengthened me so that the message might be preached fully through me and that all the Gentiles might hear. He says, all the Gentiles might hear. Please underline that. Because when you're at that place, and many of us will be at that place, we feel no one is with me. I've called the church. No one answered. I tried to get the pastor's attention. I tried to get a brother or sister. Now here I am, and I'm all by myself. No, you're not. Because Paul realized that the Lord stood with me. The word there stood means to stand alongside. And the word strengthened is where we get our word empowered me. The Lord was by my side. The Lord empowered me. The message came forth that I might preach fully through me and that all the Gentiles might hear. Was Paul saying that he had the opportunity when he stood before Nero in the courts there that at his defense... He brought the gospel. At his defense, he spoke through. He spoke to those who were charging him with these trump-up charges that he got to preach the gospel. Well, Matthew tells us, and Jesus speaks here in Matthew 10, 18. He says, on my account, you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to Gentiles. I like that, as witnesses to them. But when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say. For it will not be you speaking. I love this. It will not be you speaking, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. And Paul felt that way. Many believe he was able to preach the gospel to the Roman court, as he had just done uh, before in his, in his life to Felix and Festus and Agrippa. That Paul got to give his testimony. That Paul got to preach the gospel. He also says, notice with me in the latter portion there of verse 17, and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. This is interesting that as Paul writes that, I was wondering if he had in mind the book of Daniel and how Daniel speaks of Meshach, Shadrach, and a bad Chicano, and how they, just breaking it up, forgive me. If some of you don't know that, it's yours. But uh, Abednego, and how, you know, they were faced with, you know, 
just bowing down to the king, how they were faced with this trial of fire to be thrown into the fire. And they just stood on their faith and they spoke forth. And, and, you know, maybe he was reading that. Maybe he was remembering, or even Daniel, more, more likely Daniel himself, who was thrown into the, the lion's pit. But I'll tell you this much. Peter identifies the lion for us, of which lion he's speaking of. In 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a what? A roaring lion, seeking whom may be devoured. He says, also I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. You know what's interesting? I read this the other day. Satan is a lion, 1 Peter 5, 8. And Jesus is a lion, Revelation 5, 5. One is on a leash. The other is on the throne. I love that. The other is on the throne. And he is always with us. He'll never leave us nor forsake us. He says... The Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. I love that word. That's the word that Paul lived on. He realized that his Lord will never leave him. He was always beside him, empowering him, giving him the words to speak, being able to share his testimony and faith in the gospel. And then he just breaks out like a Pentecostal would. To him be glory forever and ever amen you know he just you know just excited there he's a man in a prison like i said he's he's a walking he's he's a walking dead man and yet he's praising god he's thanking lo- the lord although all have forsaken him no everybody left the, you know the courtroom he was able to stand on the fact that god would never leave him he gives him glory honor forever and ever amen and then he has a closing greeting. Notice this in verse 19. He says, greet Prisca and Aquila. I love that couple, man. You know, we tend to have forgotten about Aquila and Priscilla, or here they're named by Prisca and Aquila. We, we kind of forgot about them, right? After, after studying through Corinthians, we kinda, they kind of left our mind, but Paul's never forgot about them. A great couple, they met together. They, they met because they were both tent makers. And then as, they're, as they had the same trade, no doubt as they're talking, they both found out that they were saved believers. And I kind of think that they probably started sharing. Hey, you know, let me share with you some good news. What's that? Well, we want to share some good news with you. Okay, well, what good news? You have? Jesus Christ is Lord. Praise God. And they became this team. They became to minister with Paul. This couple did in Ephesus and as I said in Corinth. You guys, again, such good friends here. Such good friend or friends that he mentions them twice here and earlier in chapter 1, verse 16. He just wants to mention them. He, wa- he just greet Priscilla and Aquila and the household of Onesphorus. Erastorus, he says, stayed in Corinth, but Trophimius, I have left in Miletus, sick. Yes, Christians do get sick. You know, don't believe those on TV who says you will never be sick if you send us a love gift, right? You know, and we'll send you a sock you can wear and it's been prayed for and, you know, we get sick. Don't raise your hand. How many of you had COVID? You know, we just, it, we're not exempt from that. We're not of this world, man. We're in it. We're not of it and we get sick. And you're sick of hearing me talk. I'm going to close here real quick. No. Um, Do your utmost, Timothy, to come before winter. I just love his outlook on that. He goes, and don't forget, son, winter's coming, so giddy up. Eubulus greets you as well as Pudens and Linus and Charlie, no, Linus and Claudia and all the brethren. And his closing remarks, I mean, he's just thinking of others, man. He, he's in this stinky cell with excrement and urine and, and trash, cold, you know, or maybe hot at this point, knows it's going to be winter, and he's not complaining. He, he's thinking of others. 
Say hi to this one. Say, oh, and let me give you an update on, on this guy and, and this person. And greet, oh, yeah, please don't forget to greet this on your way if you, if you would. And all the brethren. He's thinking of others, and that's what we need to do. We need to be thinking of others. We need to be others-minded. Such good friends here. I remember, uh, I'm reminded of that Michael W. Smith song. A little corny, but it's true, right? And friends are friends forever. The Lord's the Lord of them, and a friend will not say never, because the welcome will not end. Though it's hard to let you go in the Father's hands, we know that a lifetime's not too long to live as, as friends. And now I'm going to sing it. Let me go over here. You'd like that, wouldn't you? And put that, and film me. And fil- yeah. See how you guys are? Well, Paul ends, and we'll end with this. The Lord Jesus Christ be with you. The Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Grace be with you. And everyone said. So, Father, we thank you, God, for this time. Another book, God, another privilege to read through, Lord. To learn more, Lord, more and more about you. Through these lives of Paul. And and now as we get into Hebrews, Lord, to learn more about how that book just is centered around you, Jesus. We're going to learn more about you. But thank you, Lord, for taking us through 2 Timothy. Thank you for giving us the blueprint for the church, God. That means so much, Lord God. That we learn so much from you. I pray if there's anyone here today, God, that maybe is a Demas, that you have stopped them today. The conviction to leave would lose, Lord God, would be lost, would be removed. And they see that they have purpose. That you do want to use them. Maybe, maybe there's, there's a Mark in here who, who, who somehow has blown it, God. Just, just, just blown it and hurt people and, and, and walked away and ran away. But they're back. Holy Spirit, let them know that you want to use them, that repentance brings restoration. And, and, and you love that as well. You love putting things back together. <laughs> You love putting our lives back together, God. Anyone here that doesn't know you, I pray that right now in their chair, right now, God, that they would just cry out to you, that they're a sinner in need of a Savior, and that you died on that cross, Lord, for them. And that the, the cross and the empty grave is just as, as powerful and valid today as it was then. That it gives life, new life that you forgive us and cleanse us and wash us and prepare us for what you have for us, Lord God, if we just turn our heart honestly and truly over to you. If that's you today, just cry out to God. Forgive me. I'm a sinner. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you did pray that prayer or if you need prayer at all afterwards, the prayer team would be up here. Just let them know I prayed that prayer of repentance. Come to Christ. I want my life changed. I want Jesus. And they'd love to pray with you some more and give you a Bible and send you on your, your way. And, and that would be awesome. So God bless you guys.